Hey guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments on YouTube and welcome to part four of my 13,000 subscriber Q&A series. I do want to warn you, you may be seeing part four before part three simply because I lost the upload. I do have to look for it again. I'm sure it can be corrected. It's nothing to be concerned about, guys. I will get part three uploaded to YouTube shortly if you are watching this particular piece first. Make no mistake, um, I'm not a techie, obviously, so please forgive me, but I do want to apologize to you guys for how long it has taken me to get this particular 13,000 subscriber Q&A series off the ground. So we're going to hit the ground running here. I'm going to answer just a few questions just to make sure that I am staying atop of this particular Q&A. So first question, hey, Sean, where does the comic book market expansion now stand compared to the rare coin market? You had mentioned previously that it may very well surpass the market cap of the coin market. We are still nowhere near that occurring, especially given the fact that after the pandemic, as a matter of fact, right now, as I'm recording this video, the vintage comic book market dropped anywhere from 10 to 40 percent on average. Um, I did do a video about a Reddit user that if he sold his proverbial holdings that he bought during the pandemic into the market right now, he would lose close to $69,000. The coin market actually expanded even more during the pandemic and after, and the comic book market at present time shrunk a little. So that doesn't spell very good news for that particular market overcoming the rare coin marketplace. Remember guys, the rare coin marketplace is one of the most sophisticated and mature markets in the entire antiques and collectibles trade. You can make the argument that rare art has a higher market cap, but overall rare coins in themselves are a very sophisticated market. In the US alone, the most valuable rare coin is $19 million at present time. So there's no comic book that even comes remotely close to that value. Now, could potentially comic books attempt to thwart coins in market cap and dominance over the next coming years? It's possible, but one thing that you got to understand is that coins have a lot going for them, even in the year 2023. They're rooted in history, and they're also made out of precious metals, meaning silver and gold on average. So coins, that particular market, isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I'm sorry to my critics who watch this channel and think that I'm so harsh on pop culture collectibles that they need to come into the comment section and attack me for just stating the obvious. But if you ask any expert in the antiques and collectibles trade, they will tell you the same thing. I mean, even if you go back and you reread some of the articles that I brought up that Harry Rinker put forth, he even says in a lot of those articles that equating high-end comic books with rare coins is a major miscalculation at present time. And looking at how the market did pull back after the pandemic and people returned to work, everything reopened in the economy, you can make an argument that comic books are not on par with rare coins as of yet. They're nowhere near that level of significance. And I don't think they'll have it in the future either. I do think though, the market is gonna become more established for comic books, that's for sure. We're already seeing that with pre-1965 comic books. Comic books like Action Comics 1, Detective Comics 27, even Batman 1, Superman 1. All those particular books are doing gangbusters on the overall market. As a matter of fact, I would pretty much state that every, every book pretty much from the superhero genre pre-1965 is pretty much already established. I would also include certain pre-code horror in that equation as well. So that market is exciting, but it's nowhere near on par as of yet with rare coins. Next question. Sean, could you please zoom in on what collectibles and antiques do in an inflationary period? This is based on the past and your own economic views. Okay, I did do a video on this. In all honesty, guys, I'm going to be 100% blunt with you. Antiques and collectibles and most speculative assets, this includes cryptocurrency. In certain instances, this does include gold and silver as well. Make horrible inflationary hedges. Do you want to know what the two best inflationary hedges you can invest in are? It would be Stocks are index-based mutual funds, meaning an S&P 500 index fund, total stock market index fund, or real estate. 
And there's a lot of people that love to disagree with me on that because you need to understand when inflation rises, a lot of asset classes don't follow suit right away with the exception of like, like money market funds because they're tied directly to rates. You need to realize, and, and certain bonds, obviously, you need to realize that it takes time for the inflationary period to take hold and pull other assets up with it. And if you hit a recession during that particular time frame, that's where you can have trouble in almost all asset classes. You know, I'll use this as an example. During the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, gold and silver did not start soaring in value until 2010 and 2011, respectfully. And after they hit a certain peak, stocks were already booming, the market recovered, and as a result, people diverted money away from gold and silver, and as a result, those asset classes started to level out and also decline in value, while stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and real estate started to come back and increase in value. Your best inflationary hedge is, again, financial assets and real estate for the long term. And there's a lot of people that don't like that advice. There's people that love to argue with me. I am sorry. We are not in Germany in 1930 anymore, guys. You need to realize that we have a more sophisticated economic system. We have a more sophisticated economy. We have pretty much a checks and balances in place with the Fed, central banks that govern our overall economy. As for collectibles, collectibles in general make a horrible inflationary hedge over the short term. Over the long term, meaning 10, 20, 30, 40 years, there are certain antiques and collectibles that if we look back and we analyze the market, we can make an argument, make an argument, doesn't mean it's clear cut, but we can make the argument that some of those collecting categories have done spectacular as an inflationary hedge. For instance, I'll give you one right now. Rare coins, currency, high-end art, historical documents, mainly your traditional antiques. A lot of people love to argue with me, no, Sean, comic books. Look at comic books. You need to understand what happened with comic book prices has nothing to do with their overall performance as an inflation hedge. It has to do with two main catalysts affecting that market since the early 2000s. The first is the advent of third-party grading. CGC came into that market 2000, 2001. Then you had Marvel utilizing their resources after they were acquired by Disney to create the cinematic universe that brought collectors front and center in that market where they would go after these particular items and they would go, oh my gosh, Deadpool or Spider-Man or Iron Man or X-Men, whoever it was, is going to be in the new Marvel movie. I have to invest in this particular comic book. That created a catalyst in the market. It has nothing to do with those particular items organically soaring in value as a result of people just wanting to own it or wanting to have access to that particular asset class as an inflationary hedge. Coins have that benefit simply because they're generally composed of silver and gold. So what will happen is somebody will start investing in precious metals and they'll eventually cross over and they'll become a rare coin collector and or investor. Because once you do the research, you start to realize that believe it or not, rare coins are a much better investment over the long term, or at least have been, than that of just buying and hoarding gold and silver. That's why I have a question in this q and I'm gonna answer it more in depth but it asked me what my thoughts are on silver stacking or gold stacking. You already know where I'm going with this. I do not like owning precious metals just for their bullion content. I like owning rare coins. Rare coins operate differently because you also have the collecting, the numismatic rarity component to that particular item along with the precious metals. You know, I've said this before in earlier videos. Nobody's going to the market paying a premium for a 1928 piece dollar in MS65 or MS66 condition, simply because it has almost an ounce of silver. If you look at what an MS65 or an MS66 1928 piece dollar sells for, spoiler alert, it's thousands of dollars. Nobody in their right mind is paying thousands of dollars for a little bit less than one ounce of silver. 
they're buying it for its historical significance and rarity. And that's what I like to own in my own collection. Good question. Next question. Hi, Sean. Could you do a deeper dive in the Lego sealed speculating? Yes, I can, my friend. And as a matter of fact, this is for you because I knew this question was coming. I am going to be doing more videos on this. Lego is interesting right now, how it's performing on the aftermarket more specifically and how people will pay a premium for this stuff, even though in most cases it's readily available at retail. It's very interesting how people pay a premium for these particular items all because in most cases they just want to own either the set or the minifigures. So yes, I will be doing more videos on that. I will tell you though, all good things come to an end and at a certain point, Lego is not going to be a profitable item to speculate on anymore. It could take 10 years, could be 20 years from now. But for right now, Lego is all the rage. I make a lot of money on Lego. I know a lot of people that make a lot of money on Lego. And to be fair, the market has changed since it was back in 2010, 2012. That was pretty much the golden era of Lego investing. If you got into Lego investing and speculating back in 2010, 2012, your profits were tremendous. Your profits were a lot higher than what they are today. It's not to say you can't make money today. You can. But back then, a lot less people were doing it. Today, pretty much everybody is involved in this market. It's just insane. So I do have to do more videos on it. I've just been falling behind in my work. So I do apologize. I will be doing more videos on that particular collecting category coming up. We're going to take one more question before I end this. Actually, you know what? We're going to take two. There's two good questions here that I do want to answer before I end this. First question. I was looking at the recent limited run games blowout sale and I was perplexed. I was only interested in a couple of games. Most of the titles are not that great and it's full of merch and expensive collector's editions. How sustainable is that? Are people really that interested in their recent titles? I can't shake the feeling that most people don't even talk about the company that much. Do you think that market is slowly dying? It's not that the market is slowly dying. It's that it's being oversaturated. And I've said this. A lot of people still seem to think that a collector's edition copy of a limited run game is going to be extremely sought after and rare in the future because they only mend it 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, or 5,000 of them. It doesn't work like that. This particular item that I'm holding up while it's a great game, if you never played this game, please check it out. I can't even pronounce it, so I'm not going to even try. But I will tell you, this is not comparable to a Nintendo World Championships cold cart or a stadium events or anything like that because this is utilizing mass-produced scarcity. And you guys need to realize that with the advent of all these companies like Strictly Limited Games, Limited Run Games, I think there's now Strictly Rare Games or something like that, you need to realize that this is going to be the norm going forward. And there's nothing from stopping these particular companies from getting rights to these games and even releasing them on systems that are no longer being sold at retail. For instance, let's say that Limited Run wanted to produce games for the Nintendo Entertainment System or the Nintendo 64, which they've done already in the past. They can do that as long as they have the rights. So these particular items are not going to be as sought after with few exceptions as people think they are. Because if you look... When Limited Run Games first started back in 2015, I thought, you know what, that's a cool concept. And they're only releasing one or two games per month. So literally throughout a calendar year, if you collected Limited Run Games, the average person could pretty much own the entire catalog because even if they were selling them at $39.99 a piece and they only did that twice a month, that's pretty much $80 a month that you would pay for those two Limited Run releases. Today, you go on their website, my gosh, there's a plethora of releases. They have standard edition, classic edition, collector's edition, premium edition. I mean, it's nuts. Don't get me wrong. I love their products. I love the Contra Anniversary Collection. I love the Castlevania Anniversary Collection. I love items that they put out like that on a regular basis. But from a value standpoint, it is limited as a result. Now, are there exceptions to every rule? There's always going to be that one unicorn where maybe one of these games, like I'm trying to think of one, comes onto the market and it originally sold for 50 bucks and it's going strong. It's selling for 200, 300, 400 dollars. But that doesn't mean you should buy up every single release 
thinking that, well, that way I'm guaranteed to get that one game that does go to the moon because the opportunity cost is just not there. So I will tell you that limited run games is a cool concept, but it's getting stale to answer the question properly. It's getting stale and they're oversaturating their own market. Does that mean they're going to go away anytime soon? God, I hope not. I love their products. But from a collectible standpoint, you need to realize that it is a limited market overall. Next question. Hey, Sean, could you comment on the overall antique and collectible market for postcards? What makes some cards better than others? Do you like this market long term? Okay, um, full disclosure, I do not like the market with few exceptions for postcards. What makes a postcard valuable is if it's of a certain location that has a cult following, if it's a postcard that shows like Halloween or Christmas, it has that nostalgia factor where it's from an earlier time and it shows that particular imagery on that postcard, it can sell for a premium. But I do not like the market for postcards because in the year 2023, very few people are sending postcards and very few people are still collecting them. There are certain exceptions. If you study the price history of these particular items or pieces that are being sold on eBay, there are some that are going to blow you away. You're going to go, oh my gosh, that postcard from literally like 1954 sold for that amount. But you have to understand, some of them have a cult following, especially if it's of a specific location, if it's of a grave site, if it's of a church that's no longer in existence. Those particular pieces do kind of straddle the term of being historic, but overall, I would not be investing in postcards for the long term simply because it's a collecting category that is dying. Let's be realistic. Who in this day and age, what person under 40 or what person under 50 collects postcards? It's very, very few people. And that market is not growing at all, unfortunately. So I will tell you why there are certain pieces that sell for a premium. I would not be investing in this market long term. With that being said, I will also tell you that certain auction houses won't even take postcards, even in lots anymore. They used to. Back in the 80s, 90s, postcards were a popular collecting category. They were a thing. They were a boom market. In the year 2023, not so much. Thanks for watching. This concludes part four of the 13,000 subscriber Q&A series. Please note, you may be seeing part four before part three. I do apologize for my lack of technical skills when it comes to YouTube. Thank you and have a great night.